Okay, so today we're going to be talking about my top 10 fantasy series at the moment. This should go without saying, but it's the internet, so I have to say it. This is my top 10 favorite fantasy series list, not the definitive best fantasy list of all time for all people. If you disagree with my list, if your list is different from mine, I promise it's going to be okay but please also talk with me about it in the comments about how your list is different, what books I should pick up next. I hesitate to even make this video just because there are so many fantasy series that I am just dying to start, chomping at the bit to begin that I do think could be on this list, but I, I I guess that's always going to be true for always and eternity. So let's make let's make the video. This is going to be my top 10 list, but I'm going to start with number one and work my way to number 10, which I know is is not the way people do it because they want to keep you to the end of the video. But if you aren't going to watch the whole video, I want you to I want you to go take away the best books, not bottom books on my list. So my number one favorite fantasy series of all time is going to be a surprise to no one if this isn't your first video of mine, and it's going to be The Chronicles of Narnia. Just kidding, it's The Gentleman Bastard. So this series I maybe talk about a little bit too much on my channel, but this video gives me permission to talk about it again. This follows a crew of men who were orphaned and sold to this guy who isn't cool. We're following the bad guys in this book. And he raised these kids up to be swindlers and thieves and liars and to earn their money in a not so honest way. These characters get caught up in a very elaborate plan that is so brilliant and so much to keep up with and such a ride to read. This book does deal with flashbacks as well and it's done in such a jarring way and took me so long to get used to where you could be in the middle of a really intense scene and then the scene stops and you go to a flashback and then you can come back to the scene and it does that over and over again and at first I found that very irritating but once I realized that this is done intentionally because each flashback that you get is a story in and of itself but once you're done with that and come back here, that flashback ties into the next moment so seamlessly, so perfectly. It's such a unique, initially jarring, but once you get used to it, masterful writing style that was so intentional. Takes a minute to get used to, but once you're with it, can you can run with it and appreciate it so much. I honestly don't think any author could have executed this story, this writing style, these characters better than Scott Lynch did. It is a slow beginning, a slow build up before things really get going. And personally, I have gotten to where I love slow build stories. I love a slower, more immersive beginning and then you hit the gas and go. I appreciate that pacing so much. But even back in the day when I didn't appreciate that at all and didn't want a slow beginning and just wanted the plot to begin at the beginning, even at that point in my reading life, I fell in love with this book so hard. So I really think that if you're willing to give it time, you could also fall in love with this book. This also has some of my favorite characters of all time. It has my favorite friendship of all time. I can't sing its praises enough. If you are someone that loves an action-packed, complex, brilliant plot line, if you're someone who loves deep, nuanced, brilliant characters and character relationships, if you're someone that loves a great time, a complex time, I just think that this book is amazing. I think that this series is amazing. Also, this is a series where the magic itself doesn't play a huge role in the series and the magic system is soft magic. Both of these things I typically don't reach for in my fantasy, but this series does it so well. And based off of how book three ended, I have a feeling the fantasy, the, the fantasy elements are gonna move a little bit more into the forefront in our next books. By the way, that wasn't a knock on Narnia. I do, oh, hey, that's not even the first Narnia book. I do like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I just, you know, 
it's not on the list. The next book or series that I'm going to be talking about is The Lord of the Rings, which was originally written as one big chunky book, but got published as three books. And uh, that's why it makes it on this list of series on the technicality. Also, I originally read it as a series because when I first read this series, I read it the for, for the first time as an adult. I was not very versed in classics yet. And The Fellowship of the Ring was hard for me to read. I actually ended up having to listen to the audiobook while reading along physically because Tolkien's writing style was so difficult for me. But once I clicked with his writing style, oh my gosh, I fell in love with this series so much. And I know that there's a lot of discussion within the reading community about how Lord of the Rings was great back in the day, but it doesn't hold up now. It has all these flaws. It was influential for the series, but anybody in modern time who has it on their top list is just trying to be pretentious, is just saying that, but it's not actually good enough to be a favorite anymore. Listen, just let people like things, okay? I love this series. I love it for the world. If you know me as a fantasy reader, complex magic systems and, and big immersive worlds are my jam. This is again, a soft magic system. Wow, I'm inconsistent today. I love hard magic systems and yet my favorites are soft. Actually, probably not my favorite magic systems, but my favorite series have soft magic systems in them. I have a video about my favorite magic systems. I'll link it right there. And about half of those favorite magic systems do not make it on the list of favorite series. Wow, that's interesting. I love this series for how incredibly immersive the world is. For me, immersive worlds are half of what will make me fall in love with your story. It doesn't even have to be fantasy. Some of the most, some of my favorite sci-fi books and series are incredibly immersive. Michael Creighton, oh my goodness, love his worlds, love his stories. His worlds are usually in real life world, but you know what I mean. But I feel like I'm in Middle Earth and I feel like I'm in love with the mythology and the history of Middle Earth so much so that I enjoyed reading The Silmarillion so much. And I know that there are really difficult parts of The Silmarillion, but there are also so many beautiful parts and heartbreaking parts and it's just, no! I love this world so much. I love these characters so much. A lot of people write off the character work and say that the character work in The Lord of the Rings isn't great. Disagree so hard. Frodo, don't love him in the movies, but in the books, he's such a brave, compassionate, complex person. And anytime you take a main character and start him here and then bring him down, <laughs> like Wheel of Time, one of my favorite characters was Rand. That's not, that's not a popular opinion, but I love watching a character descend and the complexities that come with that. And I loved Frodo's bravery and sacrificial self and heart and then watching everything he goes through. And then again, friendships, strong friendships are some of my number one favorite things to read about and how Frodo descends and then, and then Sam is there to hold him up and carry him and I just, I, and then I also love the dynamics between Legolas and Gimli, which I think that the movies did pretty well at getting their dynamics right, but I really just hated what they did to Legolas as a character, it doesn't matter. Merry and Pippin, just like I get, the, there are so many, there are so many amazing relationships in this series and the journey itself, I think that the pacing that Tolkien used was absolutely brilliant. Again, I have no issue with a slow build, a slow story if it's intentional and it serves a purpose and it absolutely did here. I also just love all the deeper discussions that came in this series. There are so many deeper theological, philosophical discussions that came up in this story and I love thinking through them, finding out a lot about what Tolkien believes through the way he wrote his world. I find that so fascinating and I love it when authors do that. Also, I'm a massive fan of falling action. When when you get to the climax of your story and then it doesn't just 
end there, but you get plenty of time to just be with the characters and the ramifications and the emotional effects and the worldly effects of the war that just happened. And I don't care what anybody says about how the Return of the King, when they go back to the Shire and it went on way too long, it should have been. No! I love how much falling action we got and how much we got to see what the world looked like at the end of everything and where our characters ended up. I just love this series so much. Or book, whoever you are, I don't care what you call it, I love it. Coming in at number three in my series is going to be The Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. We're about to get book four and I am whew, so excited. I have actually been doing a reread of the Stormlight Archive. My reviews, my very extensive <laughs> reviews for books one and two are already up. I'm currently reading book three, not very deep into it. You can, you can see my pencil where I'm, where I am right now. I have no idea how to describe this series for you. I mentioned before, epic worlds, complex magic systems, um, and, and deep character relations, relationships. These are things that I live and breathe for, and the Stormlight Archive has all of those things. It also has a very slow buildup in book one, but oh my goodness, it's completely worth it. The Stormlight Archive has such complex characters, and Sanderson is so great at really bringing his characters down low and exploring the reality of human emotions, which I absolutely love. I also love the slow build of relationships within the series, these main characters that we have that have no relationship in the beginning and how they come together and build and chip away at each other's faults and strengthen each other and call each other out. Not only does Sanderson have a complex world, but he has a complex universe and he has many series, books and series within the universe that will eventually all tie together and have already started getting into each other's space. And I love that. I love seeing characters in different series that belong together and wondering how they're all gonna coincide. I love the mystery of it. Sanderson's so great at, at starting a character in a certain place and then giving us only what we need and giving us some sort of mystery to draw us in and, and reveal things slowly. He's so great at massive reveals, at, at, at catastrophic endings. His magic systems are always so interesting. I just, man, phenomenal storyteller. One of the best storytellers that I've read. I also happen to be a reader that absolutely loves prose. <laughs> really thoughtful prose. They don't, I don't love flowery prose. They don't even have to be beautiful prose, though I do appreciate beautiful prose, just thoughtful prose. And Sanderson is an author that his prose irritates me so much. I'm pretty sure I pluralized prose throughout all that, and I know it's supposed to be singular. Ah, I'll do better for the rest of this. Sanderson's prose irritates me so much. <laughs> and I've talked about it in videos before and it seems like not very many people are as irritated with his prose as I am, so that's awesome. But for me, if, if an author's prose irritates me, it will really draw me out of the story. And the fact that Sanderson can be one of my all-time favorite authors despite a lot of times being irritated with his writing style, his prose, just one more reason why He's an amazing storyteller. Next series on my list is going to be the first Law Trilogy. I used to have the really pretty editions of the first Law and then I gave them to a friend because he needed to read the trilogy. And then I bought new copies and I bought the better editions, but these came in the mail and I'm non-confrontational so I didn't send them back. Doesn't matter, the content inside is still phenomenal. The first Law Trilogy, is another one that's going to be really difficult to explain because especially in the first book, The Blade itself, there really isn't a lot of plot happening. It's mostly about building up the characters. Wow, I love slow beginnings. This is a series that does a phenomenal job. This is grimdark, but in my opinion, so I'm not a big fan of grimdark in general, and this is one of the few grimdarks that I've read and come away saying, holy cow, I can like this subgenre. This is a series that does such a great job of taking characters that are 
bad, make terrible decisions, do horrible things that you would never agree with or want to do or want anyone you care about to do in their lifetime, but you root for them and you want all the good things for them, even though they will never have those good things. And you know it because Joe Abercrombie is so mean to his characters and to his world, but you eat it up, or at least I did. Complex characters that absolutely never make a decision because plot dictates it, always make decisions where you're thinking, I'm reading about real people. I'm confident about this. All of their, all of their thoughts and all of their decisions are so deeply human and flawed and so incredibly interesting. Um, Joe Ab Abercrombie, Abercrombie, I have such a hard time with this last name. His prose is gorgeous, not flowery, just beautiful. He can, he can make a disembowelment scene truly beautiful to read. It's a weird thing I just said, but I'm right. He can make a torture scene so engaging. And that's not what the entire book is. In fact, that's not what most of the book is. It just also does go pretty gruesome. But also the, the complex world that he does build very slowly, the magic that he does introduce very slowly, the really, really satisfying plot that he executes very slowly, all these things are done so well. It's his, his focus on character work in the first book is so intentional that I feel like even if you are more of a plot-based reader, which I enjoy more plot than what he gave me in this trilogy, and yet I didn't mind having less of it in this trilogy because I could see how intentional it all was. And having never read from this author before, after the very first book, I just trusted him to do exactly what this story needed and he did. And I really don't think there's anything that this author didn't execute well. Everything that he did, even the elements that were smaller, even the elements that didn't matter as much were done so well. Honestly, one of the most talented authors that I've read. I bought Best Served Cold. It came in the mail recently. I am so excited to read it. I can't wait to continue on with his standalones. I'm craving his prose because I've been reading a lot of really bland prose books lately and I'm craving his messed up worlds and characters that I just want to follow no matter what they do. Next on my list, whatever number we're on, what number are we on? Five. Number five on the list is going to be Miss Born by Brandon Sanderson again. Again, really, really fantastic, interesting magic system and the, the consequences of using magic is so interesting the way it's played out in this book. It has such, Sanderson has really slow starts, so you have to give him a minute, but it has such um, familiar concepts that we start with in this series that evolve into something really fantastic and unique. Um, really phenomenal characters, a lot of, of very satisfying character arcs, great friendships, a crew of people that do a great job of, of really calling each other out, building each other up. Still the same complaints that I had before, one of the best storytellers, not a writing style that I particularly enjoy, and yet he has two two series on my on my top list. I think Mistborn is probably the easier series to start with than Stormlight is because it's less massive in scope, but I think that Stormlight is has to be Sanderson at his best. I mean, it's so phenomenal. Next series on this list coming in at number seven, I think is gonna be The Rage of Dragons. What's this series called? I have no idea what this series is called, but it's not The Range of Dragons. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is such a brilliant fantasy series and I, oh man, I am constantly looking for series that are just really, really different. And this series does such a great job at it. Book two isn't out yet, but it'll be out in November. It's an African-based fantasy series and it all the all the mythology and the history and the magic is all based on African mythos. So it's something so different from what I'm used to reading because there's so many Euro-based fantasy series, 
But on top of that, this world is so cool. Not only is it really, really unique, but it's such a fascinating magic system. So if it, it, it's uh, one in every thousand women can has the ability to call down dragons, and every one in one in every hundred men is able to transform himself into the, like this fighting machine. And uh, this in this world, this this culture of people that we're following, they've been at war for a very long time. And we follow, it's a very um, focused story, focused in on Tao, who is out for revenge. And I don't typically like revenge plots, but I loved the way it was executed in this one. It's also a military fantasy, so there's a lot of training scenes, a lot of battle scenes. I, it, it takes elements of a story that can be kind of frustrating to read, you know, revenge plots are very focused and a lot of times the characters are really dumb because they're just out for this revenge so they make dumb impulsive decisions and Tao does that. But it's executed in a way and it's and it's bringing in all these really unique fantastic elements in a way that make it so interesting. And um, then book two does a great job of taking all the things that were great about book one and moving forward and all the things that would have been stale if we kept doing for another book and changing them and moving in another direction. And I just, I think it's, it's set out to be four books. We only have two, well, technically we only have one, but we're about to get book two and I've read it at this point because I got an early copy and I can't wait to see what Evan does with this series because the first two are so unique. It's such a unique story and it does a lot of things that I typically don't fall for but done in a way that I just did. Next series on this list I don't have because I got it all from the library but I do want to I do want to buy down the road and it's gonna be the Death Note series which I don't think anybody expected to be on my list, but it's there. I don't know if fantasy is actually the right genre for it. I'm pretty sure it's published under um, or categorized under horror, but I guess it's kind of a mix of really light horror and and fantasy. I don't really know if it belongs here. This is a manga and it follows a kid named Light who stumbles on a death note journal diary thing and basically these gods, uh, these death gods, they have to write a name in the notebook once every so often to kill someone and that's how people die. And uh, this god was bored so he dropped his notebook for a human to pick up just to see what would happen. And then he follows that human around to see what kind of mayhem it causes. And Light initially has good intentions. He he wants to rid the world of really horrible people uh, so that he can create kind of a utopia. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's great. Now, <laughs> there is a caveat here because I kind of view this series a little bit as if it stopped about halfway and then we skip a good portion of it and then just get to the end. Which isn't really what you wanna say about a book that makes your top 10 list, about a series that makes your top 10 list, but I also feel like most of the fandom agrees on that. So we all just kind of collectively live in our own little canon. Even despite that, even despite the second half of the series not nearly being as strong as the first half of the series, I still just look at it and absolutely love it. I think about it regularly. I frequently take real life scenarios and think about how that parallels with Death Note. And it's just a great series and I do recommend it if you like manga and if you don't. Next series on my list, I I struggled to figure out where to put it on the list. And that's the King Killer Chronicles. And I absolutely loved the first book. I gave it five stars. I thought that it was gonna be one of my new favorite series of all time. And it still is on the top 10 list. Book two, I found to be pretty disappointing. And not because it was a bad book, but just because it was nowhere near as good as book one, in my personal opinion. And looking at it in the context of what has been promised to us by Rothfuss, I am also really disappointed because I just don't think we have enough time to accomplish what we need to accomplish with that third book. I think in order to do everything that we need to do in this third book, to have a satisfying conclusion, to tie up the ends that need to be tied up and still maintain Rothfuss's beautiful, beautiful prose, 
I don't know how we could do it with one more book, especially since Rothfuss promised that the third book is gonna be about the size as these two. That said, I think that the quality of this, these two books are wonderful and I still put them high on my list, even though there were huge massive parts of book two that I genuinely disliked. Uh, I still, I still have so, so many mixed thoughts. Anyway, this follows a character who, we kind of have two timelines that we follow. He's telling a story about his old self and uh, himself as a kid. We start out with him pretty young. We grow up with him a bit. We're in school with him and he's discovering this really fascinating magic system. This, this series has both a soft magic system and a hard magic system. And I'll say this too, I got a comment on a video recently, I think it was on my favorite magic systems video, I'm not sure, saying that um, why can't, no, I think it was a Dear Authors video, it doesn't matter. Why can't books have more than one magic system in them? Why can't series have more than one magic system? And I, I doubt that's a popular take because there are so many series that have more than one magic system in them. Anyway, doesn't matter. So I love the magic in this world, even though there are certain elements that are a little bit too soft for me and I'm just dying for more understanding of the magic because it's such an interesting magic system and I want to understand it better. But there are several magic systems in this world and we understand them to varying degrees and I love it. Everything that Rothfuss puts, well, especially in book one, everything that Rothfuss put in book one, I felt was so intentional and I felt like I needed to pay attention to every single word and I love that feeling. Unfortunately, I kind of lost that feeling in book two. I think that there were big chunks of the book, especially one big chunk of the book that honestly just felt so much like a fantasy and not like like the author living out his teenage fantasy and not like what belonged in this book at all. It definitely has its flaws. Women really aren't w written well in this series, but I don't know, man. I have so much respect for this series despite having such mixed feelings about book two. And I just really, I'm just, I'm crossing my fingers and really, really hoping that Rothfuss proves me wrong on book three. I look back at book two, I'll reread it for sure when book three does come out. Look back on book two and, and, and say, I was wrong. This stuff mattered. This stuff was instrumental. This stuff was brilliant because I do think that this author is capable of doing that. I just don't know that he actually will. I have really mixed feelings about this one, but I still think it deserves to be on the top list because I do have so much respect for it. Now we're down to the bottom two and I don't know what order to put them in. Final two books on this list, books series nine and 10. I'm gonna go through a little bit faster because I feel a little bit less passionate about them. Coming in at number nine, I'm gonna put Harry Potter and the Harry Potter series. What, why did I say it like that? I have mixed feelings about putting this on the list because a lot of my love for it is wrapped up in nostalgia. I do think that it's a great series, but I also think that it is not necessarily my taste now. It's just when I reread it, I still love so many elements of it, but I don't know if I read it today, if it would still make my top list. But the reality is this is about my top series and it is still so wrapped up in nostalgia that I do still love it so much. I mean, I did a reread recently and then I made like 20 videos <laughs> focused on Harry Potter because I enjoyed the reread so much and it is a nostalgia that a lot of us share. And my number 10 on this list, which will be controversial in both directions because there's a lot of people that are very opinionated about this series in both directions, and that is the Wheel of Time series. I recently read through this series for the very first time, did a whole bunch of reviews, but I also did a spoiler-free series review when I finished the whole thing. I'll link it over there. I have very mixed feelings about this series, but overall, I came out of it really, really impressed by it and having enjoyed myself, especially near the end, enjoyed myself so much reading it that despite me not being a mega fan, like a lot of people are, um, I still, I just, I enjoyed reading this so much. I brought up Rand earlier. I love the main character and the journey he goes through. I absolutely loved this take on the chosen one trope. The chosen one trope is a trope that I personally really am tired of and don't care for that much. So when I picked up this series, I was like, great, 14 books, most of which are almost a thousand pages that has focused on this. But I was so impressed with how this trope 
resolved with what Jordan did with this trope, which I know Sanderson finished the series, but you know, it was Jordan's concept that Sanderson executed, doesn't matter. The point is, I was so impressed with how it all resolved. I love this world, massive, complex world. The magic systems are so cool in this series. And there are some characters that I really don't like and some characters that I absolutely love. And I think that there are a lot of flaws in this series. So many things that drove me nuts while reading it, which is why I read it so slow. But when I look back on it, I'm just so impressed by so many elements. And I, again, this is a series that I regularly look back on. It's a series that I regularly think about. And there are, there are certain things that I will complain with the Wheel of Time haters with for a long time. I will happily join in on certain complaints. But at the same time, there are also elements of this story that I think are some of the best execution I've ever read. And I, that's, I, I'm, I, I come out of this so happy that I read this massive series because I'm so impressed with so many things about it. And I know that the entire fandom says it's even better on your second, third, and fourth read through. And I believe you because of the amount of foreshadowing that Jordan did and because of how massive this world is and how massive this cast is that at some point I just had to drop certain things and say, I'll pick it up on my reread because it's too much to take in on your first time. And um, I can imagine knowing where it's all going and then watching the setup happen would be very satisfying. It'll be a minute before I go through a reread, but I do see myself rereading it down the road. So there you go. Those are my top 10 favorite fantasy series at the moment. I do see it shifting and moving down the road. I would hope so. I would hope that as I continue to read, I will continue to discover new favorites. There are a lot of books that I could predict would be on this list and um, I'm excited to read those books. Be sure to chat with me in the comments any of these series that you love, that you hate, unless you're talking about The Lies of Locke Lamora. I don't want to hear that you hate that. And I'd also love to hear what your top 10 fantasy list is. I have a lot of books <laughs> that I plan to read. I have a lot of books that I, on my to be read pile, um, but if there's any that I'm missing that people say are top tier fantasy, I wanna hear about it. And I also wanna hear about what I need to be pushing up higher on my list. So be sure to give me your top 10 list. Tell me what you love within my list or don't love. I post videos every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.